But uh, without further ado, those of you who were here yesterday, you know the tremendous ministry we received. And I'd like for Brother Lindsay to come right now and just give us the word of God. Hallelujah. You, <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's good to be here, isn't it? Amen. Say a good amen. 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 Good to be here. Amen. We're so happy for what the Lord did yesterday. What was it? Uh, 12 or 13? 12 or 12 or 13 received the baptism of the Spirit in both services, some healings last night, and a great spirit. Say you've got a great spirit in the church. Keep it that way. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> everybody loves everybody. Everybody loves the Lord. That's what counts, isn't it? <clears throat> like I said the other night, you know, if we, if we can communicate, we can help people. Incidentally, we were on television this morning in Modesto, Got your church mentioned and uh, all of that, so it's good. But like I said, if we can communicate, we can help people, and sometimes communication is difficult. I picked up something the other day I want to give to you about communication. Now, if, if you're acquainted with the military, and some of you are, <clears throat> you can readily see how this could happen. It's called a problem in communication, and it's based on an army format, and it's a memorandum. Colonel Smith, base commander, to Lieutenant, Com to Lieutenant Colonel Jones, executive officer. This is the memorandum. Tomorrow evening at 20 hundred hours, Haley's Comet will be visible in this area, an event which occurs only every 75 years. Have the men fall out in the battalion area, and I will explain this rare phenomenon to them. In case of rain, we will not be able to see anything, so assemble the men in the theater, and I will show a film of it. <clears throat> the executive officer received the information from the base commander and sent this information to the company commander. By order of Colonel Smith, tomorrow at 20 hundred hours, Haley's Comet will appear in the battalion area. If it rains, fall the men out in fatigues and march them to the theater where the rare phenomenon will take place. <laughs> Something which occurs only once every 75 years. So the company commander gave the information to the lieutenant who sent it on to the sergeant in this manner. Tomorrow at 20 hundred hours, the colonel will appear in the theater with Haley's Comet. <laughs> Something that happens every 75 years. If it rains, the colonel will order the comet into the battalion area. <laughs> and then, after receiving the information, the sergeant gave it to the squad in this formation. When it rains tomorrow at 20 hundred hours, the phenomenal 75-year-old General Haley, accompanied by the colonel, will drive his comet through the battalion area <laughs> near the theater in his fatigue, something he does every 75 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, praise God. <clears throat> now, those of you who received your baptism of the Spirit, I trust you make it a practice of praying in your spiritual language daily, on a daily basis. And I told someone yesterday, I said, uh, do it because you can, not because you feel like it. Do it because you should. And if you do it like some of us, do it long enough, it finally just becomes second nature to you. You'll find yourself praying in tongues in a lot of times in a lot of places. We had an experience <laughs> quite some years ago now. I was in the Navy. And my family had moved to Newport, Rhode Island. <clears throat> Eight of the children went with us. Eight children, my wife, and a station wagon. That was a crowd. <clears throat> Everything on top we could take with us. Well, we got over there. And we rented a large duplex, six bedrooms on each side. That's a big duplex. Now, on the other side was a very fine Catholic family. The lady was a very devout Roman Catholic lady. Of course, our kids all went to school together. The man, he was an engineer for Raytheon. He didn't go to church much, but nice people. Well, inside, in our side, we forgot ourselves. And we go through the house once in a while, hallelujah, thank God, glory to God. Let's start mumbling in tongues, maybe. 
We didn't think anything about it. We forgot over there. <laughs> Finally, one day, the lady next door says, Stan, let me talk to you a minute. What are you and Verna doing when you go through the house yelling all the time and mumbling? What are you all doing? I said, I said, Joan, I said, you know, uh, we love the Lord, and we like to praise the Lord out loud. That's what we're doing now. And then when you think we're mumbling, we're actually praying in tongues like they did in the book of Acts. She said, oh. Well, a little time passed. Again, we forgot ourselves. Hallelujah, glory to God. And we go off talking in tongues, you know. Well, one evening, after the evening meal, I was down in the front room and reading the paper. It's dark by now, unannounced, no knock on the door, no nothing. The door opens and this lady next door springs in. Wild eyed, she says, Stan, I want that Holy Ghost. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. I, 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 wait a minute, Joan. I said, wait a minute, I got to talk to you. She says, well, talk. I said, you've got to get saved first. She says, well, how do I do that? I said, well, sit down, let me talk to a minute. And she sat down. Of course, being a Roman Catholic, she knew the gospel. That's no problem. <clears throat> I said, now, Joan, what you've got to do is ask the Lord to come into your heart. You want to do that? She said, yes. I led her in a simple prayer. She asked the Lord to come into her heart. Just as soon as she said the amen, she opened her eyes and says, no, I want that Holy Ghost. <laughs> I never saw anybody so eager in my life. I said, wait a minute, Joan, I've got to talk to you a minute. So. I explained very briefly about it. I said, now you want to do that? Yes. I prayed with her. I mean, she opened her mind and began to pray in tongues easily. I'll oh, give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, there, really, there's a lady who knew nothing about it. All she knew is there's something there she wanted. She knew that. I mean, she was eager for it. And of course, with just a few words of explanation, being a lovely Catholic lady, she entered in immediately and manifested the Holy Spirit. Well, that's the New Testament way of doing it, you know. And so uh, we never cease to be amazed at how this thing works. It, now, let me say this. You couldn't plan to do it that way. I don't believe that. We, of course, we didn't. I mean, we just take off and... <laughs> in the house yelling and shouting talking in tongues and forgot about them and it was catching <clears throat> why should I be filled with the Holy Spirit I was in uh, full gospel businessmen's oh, a couple of months two or three months ago up in Oakland and uh, we'd had a meeting and as I often do in our seminars I give opportunity for question and answers it gets very interesting some people have some very good questions, and really I like to talk about what you need to know, and then we know we're not striking out, you know. And uh, we were doing that, and this lady asked the question. She asked it in the third person, but I very quickly realized it was her problem. She says, uh, some people feel it's not necessary to talk in tongues when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What's the answer to that? I said, do you have the baptism of the Spirit? She says, no, I don't. Would you like to receive the baptism? She said, yes, she was, a Baptist lady. She came forward by herself and several laid hands on her, and she easily entered in and manifested the Holy Spirit. A month later, I was there again, and this lady approached me. Now she's got a teenage boy with her. She says, I received the Holy Spirit last month. Now here's my grandson. He wants to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's the way this thing goes. If you've got something good, you pass it on to somebody. You don't keep it to yourself. You know, hallelujah. <clears throat> so, uh, in the first place, it is a command to be filled with the Spirit. Paul says in, in the Ephesian passage, be filled with the Spirit, all of this, speaking to yourself in hymns, songs, uh, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Well, that's from an overflow of being filled with the Spirit. And it's a command that we be filled with the Spirit. Now, the world tonight is that they're being filled with spirits, which leads to debauchery. Paul said, no, you don't do that, but be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, of course. 
And uh, so it's a command that we be filled with the Spirit. And then Paul says in Ephesians 6, 18, in the New International Version is the best reading on this. He says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Now, in the Greek text, that is given as a command. In other words, do it. It's not a nice to do if you'd like to. Not that. Do it. Well, now, if you're going to pray, in, if you have a command to pray in the Spirit, then the possibility of doing it has to exist. And we see that that does exist in Romans 8, and what is it, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, or with words, uh, groanings too deep for words, I think one really says. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, I haven't got time to go into a whole study of this, except to make this statement. In comparing Scripture and reading the text, it is, it is acknowledged that this does connote the speaking in tongues and praying in tongues. Now, that possibility exists, so Paul gives the command in Ephesians 6 that we do it. Well, there must be a reason, huh? Now, I think another reason, and we hardly hear this mentioned in our churches, and I've been in so many of them, but this is never talked about, and probably this is one of the greatest reasons. And I have a whole hour on this, but I'm not going into that, but just, just to say this. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14.4, 1 Corinthians he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Now, it does something for you. And anything God gives us is not just a decoration of some type, not at all. Now, in deep studies, and boy, we made real studies into this thing, what it does for the mind, the psyche, the spirit, the soul, whichever you call it here. I kind of call them all the same, but uh, what it does for the mind, spirit. Uh, one writer says it has to do with the constructive building up of the personality. Wow! That's a new ballpark of meaning. You know, I don't think any Pentecostal charismatic Christian has to be a blah or a zilch personality. Now, some of them are. <laughs> but you don't have to be. And, uh, and when I say that, I realize we don't all have the same background. We don't all have the same, edu same education. We don't all have the same IQ. I know that. That's not the problem. We can all live up to the potential that Christ gave us. That's the point. And uh, so, and it goes into a lot more than that. But it edifies and builds up. Hallelujah. And, and uh, also the uh, New International Version Study Bible on that scripture has this footnote. And that's what these people are saying. It is the personal edification in the area of the emotions of deepening conviction, of fuller commitment, and greater love. That's a handful, isn't it? Now, that's what these people are saying, that what this edification does or what it means. Hallelujah. So, it has to do with character and can help us along these lines. <clears throat> and then again, the baptism of the Spirit gives power for service. You shall, Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive power. Now, this is, a, this is a participle. You shall receive power, the Holy Spirit coming upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, when it reads like that, then, of course, it can be interpreted to read when he comes upon you or every time he comes upon you. Hallelujah. And you shall be my witnesses. That is primary in our lives. We're supposed to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. And you don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to read the book in the Hebrew and the Greek. No. But you can tell somebody what Jesus Christ means to you and what he's done for you. That's being a witness. And many times a common simple witness from people like us does more than all the preaching we hear sometimes. Amen. Your witness for Jesus Christ certainly does count. The baptism of the Spirit puts drive, or I should say, can put drive in a person. I have a little difficulty. I, it may be because of my nature. I'm not sure. 
But I have a little difficulty with Pentecostal Christians baptized in the Spirit who seemingly have no drive, no want to get up and go do something. I have difficulty with that. I was saved in the Baptist church down in South Texas as a kid nine years of age. And they taught you that you're, now you're supposed to go witness. And they don't even talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to go witness. And we did that as kids, got our classmates saved just because we're supposed to do it. And so when I see people in our churches who are supposed to have the baptism and don't do something, I wonder what, what's lacking? How come the gears aren't meshing somehow? Should put drive in a person, give them the ability to do something for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Gives power to live for Christ. If we're Christians, we ought to live like it. We ought to act like it. We ought to be ethical in our conduct with the world and with each other. And uh, the Holy Spirit gives us that ability to do. And then the Holy Spirit gives power to serve Jesus Christ. Somebody said one time, well, yeah, you Pentecostal, you always got to have signs and wonders. Well, you better believe that's what the story is all about. <laughs> of course. This is not a humdrum philosophy we're living with. It's a vital thing. David Womack, who is one of our writers in Springfield in the Gospel Publishing House, personal friend, uh, related this to me. He was down in Columbia. He'd been a missionary in Columbia. And pretty tough down there with that bunch. And so he was invited over to a home one night uh, for to eat. And uh, when they served him coffee, they served him poisoned coffee. They meant to kill him. David didn't know a thing about it. And when he didn't drop over dead, they stood in amazement and looked. And when it's over with, now the reason we know the story is the guy who poured the coffee got converted because he didn't die, then told him what he had done. <laughs> you shall drink any deadly thing, you shall not hurt them. Now, don't go try it to see if it'll work. You know. But God took care of him in a thing like this. And it had to do with the conversion of the guy who caused trouble. So, uh, and then of course we have a lot of, lot of things in, in action. You know, oh, Paul in Malta. I've been down there in Malta where Paul came ashore, you know, and the snake got a hold of his hand. And he should have died, and he didn't. He shook the thing off and caused the chief of the house to get saved and the whole clan there. So it is a miraculous religion. Of course it is. And faith brings things to happen. Oh, hallelujah. Signs and wonders indeed. Power to witness. Now, if you've been in Sunday school any length of time, you've heard the Sunday school teacher say, in Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive power, that the word for power in Acts 1 and 8 is the word dunamis, from which we get the word dynamite. Now, that is true. But then I want to say, so what? I know a lot of people who got it and don't do anything. Nothing's happened. Well, now, wait a minute. Let's examine this. Barclay has helped us here. Anybody who deals with explosives or construction know that dynamite by itself won't do anything unless it's triggered or detonated somehow. It's got to be set off. So you might have a case of dynamite down here and go nowhere. You know. And Barclay brought this out. Dunamis has got to become energia, which is flowing energy. Take the static electricity of a battery in a car. Now, the dunamis is there, the dynamite's there, but nothing's going to happen until you turn the key on, then static electricity becomes energia, flowing energy, down through the lines, lights the engine off, and you move the car out. And honey, you may have the dynamite, but unless you turn the keys on, you're not going anywhere. Are you out there? Yeah. And we have the keys to the kingdom. Turn it on and hang on for the ride. <laughs> see where you go. It could be amazing. Get out in the stream and see what will happen. Power to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Some time ago I was invited. I go down to Mexico occasionally. <clears throat> and a missionary asked me if I'd go down with them. They were going to have a pastor's conference, Mexican pastor's conference. In fact, this was, I don't know, some 50 or 60 miles south of Yuma, down in Mexico. Would I go? I said, yeah. He said, the reason I want you to go, Stan, he says, is this. 
lot of, quite a number of Mexican Pentecostal pastors don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but they're so emotional, everybody thinks they got it. <laughs> he said, they need the baptism. Said, yeah, I'll go with you. So we drove down there one day. And a little spot in the road, kind of a dirt place in the road, here's a little concrete block hut with a thatched roof on. That's where we're going to meet. In the evening, we were in a large church down in town. But here we met for these pastors. About 20 Mexican pastors were there. And so after all the getting acquainted and drinking Coca-Colas, why was the meeting started? And so I spoke for about 20 minutes. You, using an interpreter, I, I speak Spanish, but I don't trust it too far. And... Uh, so I spoke for about 20 minutes and then gave the invitation and eight Mexican pastors stepped forward. We laid hands on them and they all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Marvelous. Good meeting. <clears throat> well, we finished. We came home. I thought no more about it. It must have been about three months later. I was talking to the missionary. He said, Stan, let me tell you something. You remember when we went down to Kukaba? I said, yeah, sure. He says, let me tell you what happened. Do you remember Jesus Leon? Well, he showed me a picture later, a little nondescript Mexican. You'd never think it amount to anything, really. He says, let me tell you what happened. I said, okay. <clears throat> he said, now, Jesus had a church about 15 miles on out in the brush from where our meeting was. I said, okay. He said, I got a call from him about a month ago. He wanted me to come down and preach in his church. He said, I really didn't want to go. He said, the little fellow couldn't preach. He said, he couldn't get a crowd. He couldn't do anything right. And in fact, his preaching was so lousy, his wife wouldn't even go to church with him. <laughs> now, that's got to be bad. Because preachers' wives hear everything, you know. I mean, you're too embarrassing. <laughs> so he said, he said I, but being his supervisor, I felt I should go. So he said, I went down there, and I got there about an hour early. So I just walked in the little church and knelt on the platform to pray, and I hadn't been praying but about 15 minutes when I heard the crowd come in and the song service started. He said, I looked around to see a church full of people. So he seated himself <clears throat> at the proper time he ministered, and later he says to the pastor, Jesus, what have you done to get the church full of people and get things going like this? And this little Mexican pastor said, you remember the pastor's conference at Kukapa? Sure. He says, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Missionary says, I know that. He says, well, what happened was, in his village, he's about 15 miles out from there. He said, uh, a lady got saved. And of course, everybody down there is not Pentecostal. They're, they're, they're Catholic people, you know. And because she got saved, her older son was going to kill the preacher for her getting saved caused a lot of trouble. But she had a demon-possessed daughter. And she called the pastor to come pray that God would deliver her deliver the daughter. The preacher says, I was afraid. Then I remembered, the Lord said, you have the Holy Spirit now, you can do it. So he went over there and prayed for the girl and cast the demon out. She got saved. Mother saved. The boy came home and see his sister straightened out. He got saved. Now the whole village comes to church. <laughs> That's the way this thing works. Hallelujah. What you can't do by logic and reasoning, and now please bear in mind, I'm for all of this. You should know that. But what I'm saying is when we reach our limits, God can go beyond that and get the job done. I digress here for a moment to say this about signs and wonders. <clears throat> Many years ago down in San Diego in First Assembly, a very, it was a very spiritual church, and uh, I'll tell the story as we know it now. There was a Jewish salesman in town from New York. His dad was a rabbi. Well, being in San Diego over the weekend, you can't do business on Sunday generally. So as his custom was, he got up and dressed and was just simply standing out on the street corner where he was to decide what he would do for the day. And the, and the assembly of God's Sunday school bus drove up and the kids got on. He just stepped on the bus with the rest of them. He thought he'd go down and see what the Gentiles were doing, you know. And, of course, it hauled him to church. Oh, well, he got a morning to kill, so he goes to the church. Well, things progress, and a little elderly lady got up in the service and gave a message in tongues, which was in perfect Hebrew. 
This guy's hair stood on edge. <laughs> and after the meeting, he went down to the pastor, and old brother Fullerton, a very common man, a great man, good, but just a common man. He says, I want to meet the little Hebrew lady who addressed the assembly this morning. Brother Fullerton said, no, we don't have any. Yes, yes, you do. The little Hebrew lady who talked this morning, or over yonder. Oh, you mean the little you talked to? Yeah, whatever. And so Brother Fulton brought her over, and the Jew talked to her in Hebrew. She was blank. She knew nothing. <laughs> the man got converted on the spot. He realized God had moved. And a few days later, he got the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And the last we heard, he was on the way back to New York to tell his rabbi dad all about Jesus. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, with all of our education and logic and all of this, it would be tough to break through a background like that. But God, by the gifts of the Spirit, can break through all this thing, break down the walls, and get to people's hearts and minds. You better believe we believe in signs and wonders. Hallelujah. I got a phone call, I think three months ago now, <clears throat> from the senior Protestant chaplain at March Air Force Base, Riverside. I said, hello, Chaplain Lindsay, this is Jim Huff. You'll be pleased to know that I have been promoted to Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Air Force Chaplaincy. Was I delighted? Twenty-five years ago, that lad was a sailor in the USS Coral Sea where I was the command chaplain. And he was a Roman Catholic. I laid hands on that boy and he got the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He got out and got an education, got married, and now he's a four-square chaplain in the Air Force, I mean, Lieutenant Colonel. <laughs> Glory to God. And then we got another lad, very bright young man, who's a commander in the Navy Chaplain Corps in the Assemblies of God Chaplaincy. That lad I went aboard the ship, why, he was one of the quickest young men I ever met. And uh, it's a long story, make it brief. In our first charismatic service in the ship, this lad attended. First he told me he's going to get out of the Navy and become a Catholic priest. I said, thank God, that's marvelous. I think that's great. I don't argue people anymore. <laughs> he came down to that service and so we're worshiping he had his hands up worshiping I says Frank have you received the baptism in the Holy Spirit well of course according to his theology he nodded that he had I said Frank did you talk in tongues he nodded that he had Frank would you like to yes I laid hands on him and he began to speak in tongues right in that little meeting and afterwards he says can I tell you something I said yeah he says, when you laid hands on me, I literally saw the flame on the tip of my tongue. Whew, I've never seen that yet. <laughs> then this lad went out and got married and got an education. Now he's a somebody got chaplain and the commander of the Navy. Well, God does things that goes beyond our common ability. That's what I'm saying. If we let God be God and do what he wants to do. Hallelujah. Well, on and on it goes, and we've had so many... And uh, when I want to get a real thrill, I just look back and count the people who are doing something around the world for Christ today whom we've come in contact with somewhere and they've received their baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, now another question comes. Well, how should I receive the baptism of the Spirit? Well, I think first thing you have to have a desire. You have to want it. Nobody can make you want it. And I, I, you know, frankly, I, would, I don't even take the time with people if they're not interested. Because you're wasting your time, you're wasting their time and God's time, and not unless they really want to talk about it, you know. So there has to be a desire to receive the baptism of the Spirit. And you have to believe it's for you. And if you have doubts that it is, you'll likely never receive it. So you have to do that. <clears throat> It's a matter, this whole thing, even getting saved, filled with the Spirit, healing, all that, the whole Christian walk is a matter of faith from beginning to end. And uh, I think we can say this, you don't go around really proving anything to anybody who doesn't want to know. No. Miracles only help those who want to know. If you've got your mindset against it, it don't work for you. So there has to be a desire to want it and believe that it is for you. I was in an adjoining state, and uh, a small church, but a good church. And uh, one night, or one morning, I guess it was, a doctor's wife came forward to receive the baptism of the Spirit. She was a Baptist woman by profession, but they got in the assembly over there and for some reason, and uh, 
So she wanted to receive the baptism of the Spirit. She came forward. We prayed with her, and she manifested the Spirit speaking in tongues. But that night she came back, and I'm glad she did. She said, Chaplain, let me talk to you. She said, I came forward this morning. I'm not really sure I have it. Now, that's a valid, that's a valid question. And uh, I, I'm glad when people do that because you have a chance to help them. I said, well, I said, uh, how can I be sure, she says. She didn't feel anything. That's another problem we have. We want to feel everything. Honey, you don't get saved by feeling. You don't get anything by feeling. Now, feeling may be the result of something, but not the cause of something. Maybe we need to learn that. And so I quoted to her. I said, listen to me. Jesus said, Luke 11, 13, if you being evil know how to give good gifts into your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? I said, do you believe that? She said, well, of course. It's scripture. Sure, I believe it. I said, did you ask him? She said, well, of course. I says, can he lie? She says, no. She says, you mean I have it? Well, of course. He promised it, you asked, he gave it. Simple as that. But I don't feel anything. Now, where is the problem area? There is a problem area. Where is it? The problem area is he promises we ask, then we don't act on it. There's the problem area. If you ask him, don't be mad and start talking in tongues. Now oh, there, how much more simple can I make it? <laughs> really, how much more simple can I make it? <laughs> don't do like one lady did. Like I told you, the ladies give us our education. The men don't talk to us. They believe us or they don't, but the ladies tell you what they think, and it's amazing what they think sometimes. <laughs> I tried to help a young lady receive the baptism, and uh, now these people are all honest, and you have to deal with them that way. She says, uh, <clears throat> I'm talking about it to open her mouth and talk in tongues, and she says, but it won't come, the voice. I says, you're talking to me, you'll have a voice. So evidently you can talk. Well, you open your mouth and talk in tongues, you know. And another lady said one time, you know, uh, but I'm afraid it might be me. I said, yeah, if you ever talk in tongues, it'll be you. It won't be your mother. <laughs> and if it's not you, I'm getting out of here fast. <laughs> now I know what she meant, of course. And <laughs> but we talk like that, and it doesn't really make sense. The Holy Spirit does not talk in tongues. People talk in tongues. Acts 2, they began to speak in tongues. They, say it with me, they, say it, they, they began to. And it says they began. It didn't say all of a sudden, boom, they're talking a big voluminous bunch of tongues. No, they began to speak in tongues. I don't think they sat there and all of a sudden the thing, not boom, bam, they're all going, I don't believe that. I believe it's a very, rather a natural phenomenon. They simply, as they're worshiping, a word creeps in. They're worshiping, another word creeps in. First thing, unthinking, they're praying in tongues. <clears throat> to me, that's a more natural order. Now, I'm not against the other, and it's fun when it, when it happens, and it does happen sometimes. And when people really give vent to it, it, it does take place. So, uh, you ask, he promised, you have it, then act on it. It is that simple. I was in one of the church, and uh, we had a lady, uh, you, 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 often you'll have people who tend to be rather shy or introverted or they're not outgoing, you know, and they're afraid of themselves, afraid of their own shadows, really, in some cases. And uh, this lady was, and um, I prayed with her, and uh, she wasn't happy. I said, now let me tell you something. I prayed with you, which means you have it. So now when you go home tonight, you're not in front of people, you're not embarrassed, you're not ashamed or afraid. Just go ahead and pray in tongues and see how it works. Give me a call in the morning, let me know. And so then this morning I was at the pastor's home having breakfast and the phone rang and the pastor said, it's for you. Well, it was this young lady. She says, I went home and I remember what you said. I went to bed, she says. I got to thinking, salvation is simple. Then receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit ought to be simple. So she says, I got up and began to pray, began to talk in tongues. That's simple. 
I tell you what, honey, uh, part of our problem is in some cases we've blown this thing so out of proportion that people don't know what to do with it. I believe it's a natural phenomenon that would take place normally as we yield ourselves to Jesus and pray. I believe that. Hallelujah. And like I say, I'm more interested in what you're going to do 1, 5, 10, 15 years from now more than what you do the day you receive the baptism. The fruits in the pudding, pudding, fruits in the pudding, pudding, yeah, fruits in the pudding, okay. So, <laughs> so faith, and so, and anything you get from God is by faith. Uh, Jesus said in Mark, uh, what is it, 11, 24, all things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. I think the NIV says, what, uh, believe that you have received it, and it shall be yours. Believe that you have received it, and it shall be yours. Uh, Donald G., a great old man of England, who's one of our fathers in the faith, quite a unique character, and uh, I was so glad to read a compendium of his, his works. He said some things that today we don't remember what he said. And, uh, but before he received his baptism in the Spirit over there, an Irish brother had asked him, uh, G., are you saved? And G. said, yes, I am. He said, do you have the baptism of the Spirit? Jesus says, no, I don't. The Irish brother says, why don't you? Now get this. G made the statement, I get tired of those wearying times of tarrying. They had that problem a hundred years ago. And we have it today. Who in the world wants to tarry? The gift was given 2,000 years ago. He's not giving it again. He gave it once for all. And that happens to be good theology. <laughs> not only that, it's biblical. <laughs> but we don't, somehow we don't catch this. I don't know why it is. And we, we base most of our life on an experiential thing, and that's not good. Base your faith on the scriptures. Then the experience can follow. Hallelujah. And so... Uh, but it is a faith thing for beginning. Now, I'll drop another one on you here. And a lot of our, my brethren wouldn't appreciate this one, but it don't matter. And when I'm this old, they can't do anything to you anyway, you know. <laughs> what can they do to you, you know? <clears throat> Someone asked me one time, do they know in Springfield, do they know what you're preaching? Sure. I was in Central Assembly with Wanamaker up there and 32 people in the Holy City got the baptism. <laughs> they don't all have it. <laughs> and all the notables go to church there. And then the campus pastor of Evangel College was there and he says, Chaplain, the people at Evangel College need this. Would you come over? Sure, I'm going over. 17 students get the baptism. Sure they know what we're doing. <laughs> Now, you don't know what to do with it, so they leave me alone. But, <laughs> but <laughs> G made this statement. The brother quoted to him Luke eleven thirteen. You know, you being evil and had a good, gift, good, good gifts and all that. He said, do you believe that? And Donald G says, well, of course I believe it. He says, you don't have to tarry. It's already here. So he prayed for G, and G says... I knew I had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I did not speak with tongues, but I knew I had it. He said two weeks later, the fullness, the experience came. And he spoke in tongues. But you see, it's a faith thing until the experience takes place. That's our problem. If it doesn't happen now, we give up on the whole thing. No, hang in there till things work out. <laughs> Plan for the long haul, you know. And like the rapture, people worry about the rapture, you know. Quit worrying about it. You don't know when it's going to happen, neither do I. And I don't care how many books they write, they don't know either. And like I tell some people, if you think you're not going to make it, well, catch the heel of the guy in front of you, just go with him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, Jesus knows where you are, and he'll pick you up. But that's another point. <laughs> Louis Petrus, pastor of that great church in Stockholm, 
at that time, the greatest Pentecostal church in the world, 7,000 members, did not have the baptism of the Spirit in that he did not speak with tongues. He pastored that Pentecostal church. Others did. One night he went down to pray for another brother to receive the baptism. He spoke in tongues with him. I love it. Love it. And by the same token, we should not judge each other either. Don't judge each other. You let God be God and you be you. Let God work out his will in your life. Well, where does the blessing come from? Seemingly, most all the time, people we deal with in our churches, they'll come forward and huh, with all kinds of fear and trepidation, and they'll close their eyes real tight and wonder what God, what's God going to do to me? As if God's going to drop the axe on him, you know. No, he's not going to do that. What are the, the key text, and I don't know how we've overlooked this, John 7 at verse 37. This is the key to the source of the whole thing. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Here's that drink thing again we had in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, remember? He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart. King James says, out of his belly. Another, from within him. Out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. But this spoke he of the Spirit. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given. That is at the time this was said. The Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, how have we overlooked this? Well, we have. We don't read very carefully. The blessing is not coming from on high down and into a person. It's coming from within the person up and out. That's what it says, and that's what I believe. I think probably the baptism of the Spirit is a two-cycle thing. A person, now you have to understand, now I, I am taking for granted you understand what I'm talking about. A person receives the Holy Spirit when he gets saved. This is not questionable. If you're evangelical at all in orthodox in theology, you have to agree with this. If you don't, you're unorthodox. You're heterodox, you know. Well, that's a good first time I thought of that in a long time. Orthodox theology, all believers have the Holy Spirit. This is not questionable. That's about the Bible teaches. That's what makes a person a Christian, is the fact he or she has the Holy Spirit. And you receive the Holy Spirit when you get saved. Peter said, repent and be baptized of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what the man said. And that's what happens. So, the Holy Spirit does come in when you get converted, born again, saved, whatever term you use here. Now what we're talking, what we're talking about in the baptism of the Spirit is a release of the Holy Spirit from within. Then he fills you from inside up and out. And the manifestation comes forth. Clear and simple. And just yet some of us seemingly don't know this or haven't for some reason worked on it. And uh, Jesus, it says the same thing in chapter 4 of John. <clears throat> When Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, whosoever drinks of this water, that is from the well, Jacob's well here, whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of living water springing up into everlasting life. Again, there's the source. Friends, anything you get is coming from within. That removes the fear and the terror of an outside force, which can be scary and can be eerie. It would be for me. Because uh, mankind being what he is, uh, God understands that and God comes in and is already there and begins to work with him and fills him from within. Hallelujah. I think we handled this yester or yesterday, yeah? this thing of tarrying again we're not very careful how we read the scriptures so
Somebody will read Luke 24 where Jesus says, Tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued. And they say, Oh, the Bible says tarry. It didn't. It said tarry in Jerusalem. It didn't say tarry in San Carlos. And uh, yeah, but that, this is important that you know that. And when it said tarry, and tarry is not a holy word, you know, it only means wait. That's all, it just means wait. And uh, they had to wait until the gift was given. That took place at Pentecost. This is never a command from this point, and this is prior to Pentecost. Once Pentecost takes place, now believers receive the Holy Spirit when they get saved. Another concomitant question could arise is this, uh, if you know enough to ask it. What about the disciples prior to Pentecost? Were they saved? Not in the New Testament sense. Not at all. You can't be saved till you have the Holy Spirit. And they received it at Pentecost. Now they were followers of Jesus, but like the Old Testament saints, they're still looking forward to the crucifixion and the resurrection and Pentecost. Good theology. So, uh, but they were filled on that occasion. No tarrying since that time, no waiting. And this business of waiting and praying innumerable hours. And people have done it. Good people have done it because they didn't know better. And, and uh, being honest people, they want to be shared their hearts are right with God. And that's to be respected. But honey, he's not going to fill you with the Holy Spirit on the basis of your merit anyway. If he does, we all go home now. You out there? Yeah. Who's, who's got a merit enough to be to receive the Holy Spirit? Who's holy enough to receive the Holy Spirit? Nobody. So it's not a matter of merit. The Holy Spirit is a gift. And he gives the gift to whomever he will. I've seen people get the Holy Spirit. If it had been me, I'd have said, not nothing doing, son. No, you're not. No, no. I, I've seen good people didn't get it, and bad people got it. Your turn. Yeah. But wait a minute. I'm not the judge. Thank God I got out of that business. It just took an awful burden off of my heart. I don't have to judge anymore. The Lord and I have a little deal together. I'm saying, Lord, whoever you take, I'm saying, okay. <laughs> yeah. No. Oh, I could get carried away here, and I mustn't. I, um. Uh, our own, our own teaching on holiness has been a hindrance to us in some cases. Not that it's been incorrect. We haven't understood it correctly. And uh, so I, I don't know how you feel. A lot, of you, a lot of you probably have different. How many people are here? There may be that many ideas of what holiness is. I doubt there's a unified position. And uh, some people think, well, if you smoke, you're not holy. If you take a drink of booze, you're not holy. Or if you say a bad word, you're not holy. Or whatever. And, uh, and I'm for all of that, but I don't think that's what makes you holy. That's my point. You know? And there's some people who never say bad words, never take a drink, never booze, all that. And they're still not holy because they're not even saved. So apparently that hasn't got anything to do with it. And God has some of the most funny, odd people in the church that he considers holy. That wouldn't be our kind of people, you know. I, was in, I preached in uh, Teen Challenge in Los Angeles some years ago. And uh, now that's a, it's a men's home. Great big old home. And down below they got rooms where men can be down there drying out from booze or on withdrawal from drugs. And they're all wired for sound. Whatever goes into the chapel, these guys got to hear. I mean, they got them cornered down there, you know. <laughs> well, I knew that, but I hadn't thought about it. <clears throat> and so the director asked me, would I come? And I went up and spoke. And so while I'm getting ready to speak, and I really, I remember I had a nice sermon for them, really a nice one. And all of a sudden, at the back door, these guys down below got alerted and of course the Holy Spirit was in the whole thing. They appear at the back door of the chapel, 12 of them. I mean some of the goofiest looking character you ever saw. Matted hair, misty eyed, goofy. I mean contortionist really. And unkempt, not, you know, we, not our kind of people, you know what I mean? 
They walk right down the middle aisle. I'm watching these birds. Where do you think they sat? Front row. I've got to look at these guys while I preach. And they're giving me all kind of faces. Don't even, they don't know. They don't, you don't. Now, I don't know whether they heard a thing I said or not. I really don't know. But I gave an invitation for those who want to receive the baptism of the Spirit. Who do you think stood up and stepped forward? These birds. I couldn't believe it. Now, I'm getting ready to do something I had no faith in whatsoever. I'm going to lay hands on them. So the director either laid hands for a guy talks in tongues. I thought, well, yeah. the, tw <laughs> the 12 of them spoke in tongues. I thought, yeah, well, you know, it happens. You know, forget it. Don't, don't, don't even talk about this anymore, you know. And <laughs> it must have been two years later, I saw the director of Teen Challenge again. I said, hey, Don, remember when I was up with you a couple of years ago and preached for you? Yeah, sure. I said, you remember those guys that got up from below and came down and we laid hands on them, they got the baptism? Here you are. I said, what are they doing now? Oh, well, he says, some of them are working on the streets handing out tracts, some are working in a downtown mission, some are in Bible school. They were all cleaned up doing something for God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I would have told them, go home and clean up first. Of course, you'd have lost them if you'd done it. God took them where they were. You know, God doesn't get embarrassed with us. We get embarrassed with one another once in a while. God doesn't. He saved these guys right there and filled them with spirit. Then they begin to clean up their act. Honey, you clean up your act as long as you live. And who's going to say right now he's got it all cleaned up? Are you? Wait a minute. Ooh, wait a minute. No, you're still working on it. If you're going somewhere, you're working on it. If you reach perfection now, you've got a pretty sad future. You're not going anywhere. No, we keep working on it. And so that's the way God looks at it. So I don't judge people anymore. Uh, God can save who he will, you know. And who would somebody say, you know, when you preach holiness, you preach holiness to the believer. You preach Christ to the sinner. Now that's the order of the whole thing. Praise God. And there, of course, there is no perfectionism, contrary to some opinions. <laughs> no, we're working on it. Growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that takes place as long as we live. Now let's see. Is that the end of this? How, what, uh, what should be the results of some of this? I was in Taunton, Massachusetts many years ago. And a uh, large church. Good church. <clears throat> and I spoke on the baptism of the Spirit. And that morning, quite a number came forward and received the baptism of the Spirit. Now, see the scene. Uh, well, a middle-aged lady, a little older, came forward, plus others, of course, received her baptism. Now, this lady and her old brother had been members of that church. They sat ten rows apart and never spoke to each other for ten years. There had been a family indiscretion of some kind, and so they're on the house. Ten years, same church, ten rows apart, not talking to each other. The lady received the baptism of the Spirit. She walked the ten rows back and kissed her old brother on the cheek and healed the whole thing. <laughs> That's the way this thing works. I was over in Tucson, Arizona, and uh, had a good meeting, and quite a number received the baptism. One little Mexican lady, bless her heart, I can see her yet. She received a baptism, I don't know, on a Sunday, I suppose. Wednesday night she came back, and in her halting English, she says, Brother Lindsay, she says, I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit Sunday. I said, yes, I know you did. She said, you know, somebody had bad-mouthed her, had uh, gossiped about her, really had injured her psychically, psychologically rather, and uh, caused her difficulty and rumors. She says, I hated them. She says, 
But since I received the baptism of the Spirit, the Lord has taken all the hate of them out of my heart. I don't hate them anymore. Isn't that beautiful? I think that's beautiful. That's the way this ought to work. It ought to do something for us. Hallelujah. Well, I think I've told you enough for tonight. <laughs> Praise God. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a thing to be desired by all of God's people. And not only the initial experience, but let it work out in our life and in our conduct. Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for your goodness and your mercies to us. Bless this people, this church, this pastor, this board, the teaching faculty, the departments of the church. Let the Spirit fall upon the entire group. Make out of it what you will for your glory in this community. Fill people with the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you tonight, are there those who have not yet received your baptism of the Spirit? You'd like to have prayer. Could I see a hand tonight? Anybody who's not yet received? We'd be glad to pray with you if you like. Hallelujah. And uh, are there those here tonight who need healing in your body? So everything's not all right. You need prayer. You'd like to have prayer? If you would, would you stand to your feet, please? Please stand to your feet. Now, don't do like a lady did to me one time. I was preaching. We prayed for the sick. Then the meeting's over, and everybody's out in the foyer. And then she said, will you pray for me out there? I said, no. I said, the anointing is lifted. Up whereupon she was not very happy, and that showed a great sign of spirituality. And... Um, those who'd like to have prayer, please come forward. We'll be glad to pray with you this evening. Amen. Praise God. Are the elders that just stand right there? Are the elders of the church here? Come pray with us, please. Amen. Praise God forever. If you need healing, please come forward. We want to pray right now. Amen. I will ask you what your difficulty is, just briefly what it is, so I know how to pray. And we'll believe God to heal you now. I believe he's going to do it. I, I sense this tonight. Amen. Now, give me a group to come up with you. Kind of close the gap here. Close the gap here. That's it. Amen. Why don't the rest of you get up and come be a prayer group with us? Sure. Let's do that. I'm going to start down here. Begin to worship. Worship is the key to getting anything from God. So just begin to praise the Lord. Go right in. Just begin to praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
just a word of how are you feeling? He came here got a pain in his back down in his leg. Well, hey, let's thank God for it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sure. Hey, Amen. Are you feeling better? Yeah, it pains in her neck and that. Yeah. Well, some pe healings are gradual. So thank God for what you have and go on with it. That's it. And when you got it completed, come back and tell us. Amen. All right. How are you feeling? Wonderful. How about your sister? Well, I felt good all day today. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God forever. Let's raise our hands and give God the glory. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. 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 Glory be to God. Oh, shout with me a little bit. Hallelujah. 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 Glory, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He calabosa. Let's pray in the spirit for a moment. Glory, glory, glory to God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory be to God forever and forever. Amen. Hey, there's a shout of victory in the camp. Glory, glory to God. Amen. Does anybody have a tongue or a prophecy you'd like to give? Praise God. This is marvelous. We'll get reports out of this. Now, when you realize God heals you, tell somebody. Then let the church know because it's encouraging to the church. Amen. And once in a while we like to get feedback. It helps us in our ministry. Sure. Talk about it. Talk about the good things of God. Hallelujah. Let it be on your lips. Oh, hallelujah. Shout with me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Well, praise. Don't want to see the auditorium, Mahari. 
shall live by his faith the just shall walk by faith the just shall look to God by faith to bring to pass the things that are not that they shall become what they should be yea look unto the Lord and don't doubt but believe yea give yourself unto God wholeheartedly you shall see these things come to pass for the just shall live by faith let's thank him friends hallelujah oh hallelujah 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 Glory, 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 hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God forever. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, I tell you, the revival's on. <laughs> the revival's on. We'll give the glory to Jesus and tell of his love and tell of his love. We'll give the glory to Jesus and tell of his one. We're going to sing it again. Remember the books and the tapes in the foyer. Mrs. Lindsay, be there to serve you. Sister, I'll turn it back to you. We'll give the glory to Jesus and tell of his love and tell of his love. We'll give 